the recording has uh, started so we're going to um, resume let me just go back and share the screen pdf all right so uh, we are talking about the practical side you know how do we live sanctified in christ first we said god instructs us he says i want you to possess your vessel in holiness and honor that means you hold yourself that way you know that means you're making your deliberate choices based on this that i'm holding my vessel in holiness and honor so the choices i make the yes and the no that i say to people to situations to temptations is based on this that i'm holding my vessel in holiness and honor secondly a very important key is to walk in love to walk in holiness. First Thessalonians 3, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Could somebody read that, uh, these two verses for us, please? It's on the PDF. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, please. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another to, and to all, just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Thank you. Now, in the same episode where we just read from chapter 4, in that same episode, Paul is writing to the same people. He's giving them, giving them another instruction. He says, I want you to increase and abound in love. Increase in a bond of love to one another, to everybody, right? to walk in love. So that, that means, why are you doing? Why are you walking in love? So that you can be established, blameless in holiness before God. So I want you to see the connection. You walk in love towards everybody so that you can be established as a holy person, I'm blameless in holiness before God. So these are connected. God is love, God is holy. And he's saying, I want you to walk in love so that you can walk in holiness. How does this work? Well, if I walk in love, the Bible says, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, love does not rejoice in sin. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. So love itself is, is seeks for holiness. It seeks for what is right, for what is good before God, what is pleasing to God. So when we walk, I was referencing 1 Corinthians 13, 6. So when we walk in love towards people, it enables us to walk in love, in holiness before God. Right? So... We have to think about this. Is what I'm doing out of love? Very simple question. Am I loving the person? And when you're loving the person, you can be sure. And when you're doing things out of love for the person, you can be sure that you're going to be walking in holiness before God. Because love leads us into holiness. So, love is forgiving. Love is patient. Love is kind. All these things will cause us to walk in holiness before God. Now, you know, sometimes in some in some Christian circles, the emphasis is on so, so much on holiness, there is no expression of love. And to the point where holiness then becomes a set of rules, it becomes a set of do's and don'ts, it set, becomes a set of this is right and this is wrong. Uh, and there's no love for people. And then you question, are we emphasizing just an outward form? Or are, are, are we actually walking in holiness before God? Because if our emphasis is on you know, do's and don'ts and standards, but we're not loving people, then we are not walking in holiness before God. Okay, so understand the second key 
to walking in holiness. Just walk in love, you will walk in holiness. Do what love will do, you will end up walking in holiness before God. Love is, like we said, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love is not boastful, love is not irritable, love does not keep a record of the wrongs that have been done. Love believes the best of every person. Love uh, endures all things. So this is love. When you walk in love, you are walking in holiness. You are est being established. Your heart is being established in holiness before God. Right? Connected with that is that our um, standards uh, 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 choices are uh, things that are come out, uh, uh, you know, that are acceptable before God, right? So uh, let's read Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Somebody could read this, please, for us. Ro Romans 12, 1, 2. Number one, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you. So notice what Paul is saying. Present your body. You know, we talked about holding our bodies in holiness and honor. Back on the same topic. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy, pleasing to God. Which is your act of worship. So, a living sacrifice. <clears throat> it seems, you know, what we say as two opposites. It's living, but it's a sacrifice. Usually a sacrifice is something you kill, right? But he says your body is a living sacrifice. It's alive, but it's offered as a sacrifice to God. It's set apart, it's holy, it's pleasing to God. So this body is a living sacrifice. So part of you know, this life of holiness, living in sanctification, is understanding that our body is a living sacrifice to God. And it's part of our worship, service, or worship. The word service could also be translated as worship. So it's part of our worship toward God that, <clears throat> that this body is offered, is kept as a living sacrifice a sacrifice is completely offered it's given to god and uh the way we do it is he says don't be conformed to this world let's don't follow the standards the values the patterns of this world don't be conformed to this world but Be transformed. Have a change. Change in the way. Uh, the word transformed, uh, many, as many of you know, it's the word metamorphosis. Just like how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. It's, it's a transformation that takes place. So he says, don't be conformed to this world, but you have a metamorphosis, a supernatural change in your way of life, your lifestyle, your standards and values by the renewing of your mind, by the renewing of your mind. So the renewing of our minds, that means we change the way we are thinking. What does it mean to renew your mind? So there are two levels at which we can think. You can we can think according to the ways and the thoughts of man, or we can think according to the ways and thoughts of God. So renewing our mind means, instead of thinking, according to the ways and thoughts of man, according to the ways and thoughts of the world, we begin to think according to the ways and thoughts of God, which are much higher. So a renewed mind is a mind that is thinking according to the ways and thoughts of God. 
And we do that by thinking in line with the word of God. Right? So when you and I start thinking in line with the word of God, what's going to happen to us? We're going to go from being caterpillars to butterflies. Transformation. Uh, our standards and values are going to undergo such a metamorphosis. We're not going to be conformed to the world, but we're going to be transformed. We're going to be living at a much higher level because now we have changed our thinking. We are thinking in line with the word of God. We're thinking according to God's ways and God's thoughts. So part of our living holy, of offering our body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is our act of worship, is renewing the mind. You choose to think in line with God's word. So, for example, if somebody comes and does you harm, I mean, does something unfair and unjust, now we have, we have the choice. I can retaliate or I can think in line with God. What did God say? Well, if I read in Romans 12, God says, don't repay evil for evil but overcome evil with good. So I have a choice. I can repay evil for evil. Or God said, God's higher ways and higher thoughts are overcome evil with good. So even though that person may have done something bad, I do something good. So what's happening? We are, in, we are operating out of a renewed mind, a mind that is thinking aligned to God's ways and God's thoughts instead of man's ways and man's thoughts. Man's ways and man's thoughts are, hey, repay evil for evil. God's ways are overcome evil with good. So I'm renewing my mind. I'm choosing to think God's ways and God's thoughts. And the moment I'm doing that, my whole life is transformed. I'm not no longer conformed to this world, but I'm transformed. We are metamorphosized. The caterpillar becomes a butterfly. You're transformed. And in the process, you have presented your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God in doing that. So, our standards, our values, our, the way we live is a metamorphosized lifestyle that happens by the renewing of our mind with the Word of God. Let me pause here. Is this clear so far? Is that... Okay, you understand that? Yes, Pastor. Yes. I just had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, keeping ourselves uh, holy, sanctified, like uh, in the in the days that we live in, uh, it is very subtle, right? How the evil is. It's kind of very subtle. So, uh, how do we keep guard of uh, the subtle things that the evil one brings in? How do we? Or to say, how do we discern? Hmm. So, so one, so there are some things that are very clear, right? God says, do this, don't do this, you know, very clear. But then there's also one more thing the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, if there is something wrong, the Holy Spirit will tell us. He will bear witness inside us. Right? And when we are sensitive, when we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we will know something is wrong. Right? That, uh, 
Uh, and so the Bible says here, and I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. No? So that means when the Holy Spirit tells us something is wrong, then my responsibility is don't grieve him. You say, yes, Holy Spirit. I will, I will say no. Because he's telling me in my spirit, hey, be careful. That's not right. Don't do that. You know, so when I can't find something in the Bible, like you know, it's, it's, there are, like you said, there are some things that are very like you know, how, how, what should I do about this? Listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, now, the voice of your own spirit telling you what's right and wrong is called conscience. Okay, uh, in, in Romans chapter two. Um, the Bible talks about this, that um, God has put a conscience. This is verse 15, Romans 2, verse 15. He says that the law is written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts accusing or excusing. So your conscience, it's your conscience is like the law of God put in your heart. It's the voice of your own spirit. It's going to excuse you or it's going to accuse you. It's going to tell you, hey, that's fine or that's not fine. You know? So one, so we for all of us, there are both there's the voice of our conscience and there's a voice of the Holy Spirit. Right? So you listen. What do you feel inside? If your conscience says, No, don't do it then don't go against your own conscience. Your conscience will accuse you or excuse you. It will say, yeah, that's okay, or it will say it's not okay. And your conscience is the law of God written in your spirit. Secondly, the Holy Spirit bears witness. The Holy Spirit will tell you yes or no. Right? And so you've got to listen. So. Especially in these things where you, know, you, you can't find a chapter in verse, uh, you know, what is right, what's wrong, then you listen to your conscience. Listen to the Holy Spirit and, you know, guide you there. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. I'm looking at um, the question in the chat. Uh, John says, uh, could, you show, uh, could you show some light on, do not be conformed to the world, practically. This is included seeing for office parties in pubs or listening to secular music. Now, you know, uh, I don't want us to, when it says don't be conformed to the world, the most important thing is not to pattern ourselves, our lifestyle after this world. And uh, there are these kinds of things, for example, okay, let's say going to the pub. Would you go or would you not go? Right now, the Bible never says don't go to the pub. What the Bible does tell us is don't get drunk. So, I'm not afraid to go into a pub or a place where they are drinking. I'm not afraid to do that. I can go in there, and I have been in there, you know. Uh, and I go in there because I want to befriend some people. I want to reach out to some people. Uh, I want to keep friendships with people. But even if I'm there, I'm following what the Bible says. I don't drink and I don't get drunk. Right. So it's not about the pub. The instruction is avoid drunkenness. So I don't drink and I don't get drunk. But I could mingle with people in order to influence them for Jesus, right? Now, secular music. Now, in secular music, there's just a wide range of secular music. And uh, now, I personally, you know, may listen to some classical music, which is not Christian. I may listen to it now and then, uh, or instrumental, whatever. But I don't. You know, I personally may not need to, I don't need to listen to secular music, and I don't, you know, I'm talking about general. But let's think about a musician. 
he may need to listen just to know what's happening, you know, in the music field and whatever. That's up, that's their choice, right? Uh, so the, the important thing is, you know, uh, let me give the scripture here, uh, Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, uh, the, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, I mean, he's talking about, uh, you know, what you eat, what you drink, how you live, and all of those things. And uh, he gives us certain instructions, right? Uh, of how do you make these decisions? How do you, you know, decide what to eat, what do you not eat, so on and so forth. And I'm just going to highlight um, uh, certain things here. You know, so we know, and I'm just going to highlight a few things. In Romans 14, he says, well, first of all, we know that uh, verse 10, we're all going to give an account to things to God, Romans 14, 10, and verse, Romans 14, verse 12. And then second, verse 13, he says, don't cause another person to fall. So that's important in making that choice, what do you eat, what do you drink, etc. Don't make somebody else fall. Then understand verse 17, that the kingdom of God is not about eating, drinking, but it's about righteousness, peace, and joy uh, in the Holy Spirit. Then verse 19, he says, do things that promote peace. Right? Do things that promote peace. And then he says, um, uh, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, where's this thing? Up? I forget this verse here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, verse 5. Let each one be fully persuaded in his own mind. Romans 14, verse 5. Latter part, let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. So there are certain things which are, you know, I would say, uh, you know, you could eat this or you, you could eat that. Somebody listens to secular music, some people don't. Some people may go into a pub, some people may not. So we don't judge each other on these things. You be persuaded in your own mind where you are going to draw the line. Right. Somebody may listen to secular music, maybe because they are, you know, you know, maybe their profession needs them to do that. They are a music teacher uh, in a, you know, uh, somewhere, and so they need to know what's happening in the secular world, so they can then teach their course or whatever. And that's their profession. Now he's a believer. Uh, now he may do, may have to do it because of, you know, doing that so, of uh, his profession. So. Um, uh, so that's something where, you know, I would say, you know, you follow the instruction, Romans 14, and then you be fully persuaded in your own mind, where you are going to consecrate yourself before God. The most important thing is we don't do things that are displeasing to God, right? Yeah, so um, the, the uh, follow-up question is also, you know, what if somebody's offering us food offered to idols, right? So, uh, well, uh, there are two sides to this. One, I know that I can pray over anything, sanctify it and eat it. It will not affect me, right? So that's First Timothy chapter four. Uh, you know, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you know, whatever is sold in the, in, the, in the food places, you buy it. You know, we don't know when a person is, you know, uh, killing that animal, he may have dedicated it to his God or goddess before killing it. But in the end, it's, you know, it's being sold in the market or it'll appear in the food table in a restaurant. We don't know. So it's being served to you. You know, you don't have, you have no idea, you know, how it has been processed. But what do you do? Before you eat it, you pray and it is sanctified by the word of God and pray. You're not afraid, right? But then there's the other side where I don't want to eat something that conveys a message, a wrong message, and you read about this in 1 Corinthians 8 uh, and also in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, that conveys a wrong message to people that as I'm believing in the idol or believing in their whatever they've done, witchcraft. So suppose somebody comes and says, hey, eat this. Uh, it's going to give you spiritual power. I'll say, no, thank you. I'm not afraid of that food. 
it's just food, you know, whatever it may be a fruit or it may be something else. I'm not afraid of it, but I do not want to give them an understanding that, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to receive that spiritual power big through that food. I don't need it. So I will say no. Right? Or uh, if they come say, hey, this has been offered to an idol, it'll give you blessing in your life or whatever, you know, you know, no, thank you. It's fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no. I politely, I refuse. Why? I don't want to give them a message that I am participating in the worship of that idol or participating in receiving that blessing, so-called blessing from the idol. So I refuse it. It's not that I'm afraid of the banana or I'm afraid of the food that has been made, but I am sending a message saying, I don't need the blessing of that idol. So that's what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 8 and verse 10. And if, a, if some other person is watching you, they will think you are engaging in the worship of that idol by receiving that food. So they will be caused to stumble, especially if it's a young believer. They may also participate looking at you, right? So, uh, uh, you know, they will they will uh, uh, be caused to stumble. So therefore, I refuse to participate in partaking of the idol, right? So going back uh, to the whole issue of secular music. So you ask me, do I listen to secular music? My answer is no. Why? Simply because uh, the, of the influence. I don't want that, you know, the, the words, the songs, the lyrics, I don't want it. Uh, I, I, I listen to a little bit of music, and most of and all of that is, you know, Christian music, worship music. That's me. So, uh, so I'm just answering that question there about uh, secular music. So, if you ask me, do should 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 we listen to secular music? Uh, I said no. There's no need to. But I will not judge another person, another believer who may listen to secular music for whatever reason, right? Sometimes you may, you may have special situations where, you know, somebody's a music teacher, a musician, and they may need to know what's happening in the music industry. So then they are exposing themselves to all the different things in, in their field. So I will not judge that person. That's their job. Um, that's their profession. Of course, he's a believer, uh, but they, you know, engage in that. So I will not judge that person. Uh, uh, for that person, it's okay because that's part of their job. They need to know what's happening in their music industry uh, or in their field. They may be teaching music or et cetera, et cetera. Right? Or sometimes, I don't haven't done this recently, but sometimes I may listen to instrumental music that's not necessarily Christian, right? It's, it's just play. I haven't done it for a long time, but so I, I don't see any, you know, uh, uh, harm with that. And I will not judge somebody who does that. It's their choice. So the, re the main question is this. What is the impact of that music on your life? And we know that secular music, a lot of secular music, especially the words, the lyrics, uh, are not very positive. They don't have a good influence on our lives. Therefore, we stay away from those kinds of things. Now, if somebody wants to listen to some generic, general, secular music, I'll not judge that person. It's their choice as a believer. And I just, you know, follow the instructions here in Romans 14, which the Bible says, let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. If you ask me personally, should I be listening to secular music? My answer is no, there's no need uh, because of the impact it has, the lyrics have on us. Um, did I clarify that? Is that okay? Or is there a follow-up question? You're welcome to ask. You clarified it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. There's another question here about uh, beard and mustache. Yeah, there is not, you know, we don't, uh, there is no problem. Uh, you know, but that's just the outward form. So you don't have to worry about beard, mustache, and you know, uh, and, and 
you know, that's just, that's just an individual preference. Now, some people may quote from the Old Testament, but then you need to know, and we, we will be seeing it in a later chapter, that we are not under the Old Testament law. Uh, we are free from the law, which is the law of Moses, uh, uh, but we live by a higher law, which is the law of love and the law of the Spirit. Uh, so uh, when you're living by the New Testament, those things don't apply. We live by the law of the Spirit and the law of love. We will cover that in an upcoming chapter. Okay, but a quick answer to the, your question is, no, you don't have to be worried about it. It's your personal choice. Um, okay. All right, uh, interesting questions. Anything else? Okay, so what we were saying is, uh, uh, is it okay to hear news? Um, so there's, uh, so the answer is, uh, um, uh, is it okay to hear news? Uh, the answer is yes. You know, I, I, I it's perfectly fine uh, because you know, as part of living on the earth, it's good to be informed of what's happening. Uh, it's good to know what's happening locally. That's in your part of the world, for instance, in, in my city, in my country, uh, in the country, in the city, in the country where you are, it's good to know what's happening. Plus, it's good to know what's happening globally uh, for many reasons. One is just for you to be aware, to be informed. Uh, uh, also, in terms of maybe if God wants you to pray, um, sometimes you may need to go on missions to certain places. Sometimes you may need to help people in certain areas. So for many number of reasons. It's good to be informed of what's happening uh, in, in the world around us. Now, of course, you know, because of, uh, uh, you know, what is happening in the world today in the sense that uh, there's an overload of information. There are so many channels and, you know, people producing news and a lot of the news could be false and uh, people are uh, engaging in a lot of, um, uh, propaganda kind of thing. So you have to be careful where you get your news, right? So use reliable channels, uh, use uh, uh, channels that uh, present facts as best as possible. Uh, so do that. You know, so, uh, you know, uh, for, for me, of course, I, I, I read the local newspaper because I need to know what's going on in my own city. Uh, I also look at a local newspaper, which is nation nationwide, so it gives me news of what's happening in the country. I also uh, listen to BBC, so uh, that gives me world news, or global picture, so need to know what's happening in various parts of the world. And it's also interesting from a biblical perspective when you, uh, and you know, in your second year and third year, uh, next semester we'll be talking about uh, uh, I'm not sure next semester, but in your second year and third year, uh, we'll be talking about um, uh, uh, the end times. We'll be talking. We'll be studying Revelation and Daniel, and so when we get into the details, then you know you really want to know what's happening with the nations that have been spoken of in the Bible and how they are interacting, because you're looking for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So from that perspective, also, it's very interesting to know what's happening, you know, in Europe, in Asia, in Turkey, in Egypt, in Syria, Russia, China. How are all these nations interacting? Because, you know, you want to know, you want to see the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So from all those reasons, you know, I, I keep in touch with world news, keep in touch with what's happening uh, from that perspective. So, my, so the answer to your question, is it okay to hear the news? I think every Christian needs to know what's happening. Uh, for for various for all the reasons that I mentioned, but just be careful. Just use reliable sources for your news. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rosalind, uh, can take this question for watching movies. Yeah. So even same thing for watching movies, right? Uh, we you know, there's nothing wrong in movies. We watch movies. A lot of good Christian movies are out there, and also. Uh, quote unquote secular movies that are more, uh, you know, they could be documentaries, they could be biographies, they could be uh, general in the sense without, you know, uh, 
uh, wrong things, uh, you know, filth and uh, violence, all that is. So yeah, all that is fine. But the moment we start seeing evil or, or you know, being those kinds of things, then you filter those out, you know. I'm not going to watch those things, right? But there are good Christian movies uh, which which have great value, and which are having great influence for God. So there's nothing wrong with that. the The film is just a medium. What's important is the message. What's coming across through that. Uh, so that's what we have to be careful. Uh, Zilatoli, uh, there's a question on tattoos. Okay, I didn't know we were going to get into all this today. <laughs> But uh, we will answer those questions. Okay. Um, uh, what about tattoos? Now, as far as tattoos are concerned, the Bible is silent. The Bible doesn't say anything about tattoos. In the Old Testament, we have, I think, two references where um, two or three places where God tells his people in the Old Testament, don't mark yourself, don't cut yourself like others. And so when you read the context, and I, you know, I, I can't remember the references offhand, but when you read those contexts, God is saying, don't do it like the other, the other tribes, because they do it as an act of worship to their God. So other tribes would mark themselves, would cut themselves up as an act of worship to their gods. And God says, don't do that. Now, some people quote those two or three references and say, don't have tattoos. It's not talking about tattoos. It's talking about marking your body, cutting your own body as an act of worship. Okay, so so basically, the Bible is silent as far as tattoos are concerned. So, what should our response be? First, don't judge somebody who has tattoos. If they want to mark their body and put tattoo on, it's their choice, right? Uh, second, so we will not judge them. Second, we just have to look at the medical side of tattoos, meaning how is it going to affect your body? You need the body is a temple of God. How is it going to affect? Now, there are varying, varying, uh, varying information on this. Uh, you know, some say, okay, you know, today the way the whole, whole tattoo industry works and how they do it is very safe. It doesn't harm your body, etc. But then I just look at it as, hey, you are uh, you're unnecessarily putting some chemical in your body or you know on your skin and so on i just look at it from that perspective why would you want to do it so just you know avoid it so if you ask me personally this is my personal opinion it's not a chapter and verse my personal opinion is it's unnecessary why do you want to do it uh will i judge somebody who has tattoos i will not it's their choice will i prevent somebody from getting a tattoo I will not. That's their choice. I will just tell them personally, I don't need it. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's good. But God is not going to hate you or send you to hell because of tattoos. Right? It's not there in the Bible. So um, that's where you know uh, we leave it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, Matthew 15, 10, 11. All right, beginning in the same scriptures. Um, and when he called the multitudes, uh, he would have said, Not what comes out, goes into the mouth of false man, what comes out of the man, this defiles man, passing in heaven, and the rest. Okay. So basically, Jesus is, you know, Matthew 15. Uh, so, you know, the whole issue was on uh, uh, Matthew. Uh, Jesus had finished feeding the 5,000 in Matthew 14. Uh, in Matthew 15, they complained to Jesus about um, the disciples. I think they had just plucked corn and. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So in Matthew 15, uh, the disciples had, uh, yeah, they had eaten with unwashed hands. So that's when this uh, whole question comes up, you know, why, why, why are your disciples uh, not washing their hands uh, before they eat? Um, because this is the tradition. 
So then Jesus, you know, uh, responds back to them saying, hey, there is something more important than just the washing, the physical washing of the hands. Um, and and uh, then he says, uh, you know, it's not what goes in, but it's what comes out because what comes out is an expression of what's in the heart, right? Matthew 15, verse 18 and 19. Right, so these are the things, and it's these expressions that what comes out, which which expresses the heart. These are the things, verse twenty, which really affect the man, which defile the man. So he's contrasting between you know eating with unwashed hands to having evil in your heart, which is then expressed through the words of our mouth. And he says that's the real danger, which destroys our lives, not eating with unwashed hands. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, so it is also about what you feed into your heart, right? What we listen to, what we watch, uh, what we read. Uh, so it's also about what is going inside, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, definitely that we have to be careful. You know, so I'll just give you know, maybe two scriptures on that, like, which tell us, you know, we have to be very careful of what we put into our heart. Uh, one is First Thessalonians chapter five, like it says, um, uh, verse twenty-two. You know, abstain from every form of evil. So stay away from every appearance of evil. Uh, I also like um, uh, Psalm one hundred, where he says, "I will," um, verse three, Psalm one hundred, verse three, "I will set nothing wicked before my eyes." So I'm not going to, you know, see anything evil. So, because these things definitely influence us. And in Proverbs 4, verse 22, you know, God says, guard your heart with all diligence, because out of it come the issues of life. So guard your heart, what goes in, you know, uh, instead of attend to the word. So the, so the answer to a question is, yeah, we have to protect what goes into our being. So we keep all evil stuff out, whether it's through music, through movies, or, you know, whatever form. How med which, which medium evil is presented to us, we keep it away, right? Uh, and so we filter those things out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, welcome. All right, quickly we'll answer the remaining questions here. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a question here about uh, uh, about wearing gold. Can you wear gold or not? Yeah. You know, uh, the answer. I mean, I just give a quick answer. The answer is yes. Um, now, when you look at the passages in First Timothy chapter two and First Peter chapter three, uh, where the Bibles, you know, uh, people use that often to say, you know, don't wear, you know, shouldn't wear gold, those are the thing. But if you look at Sarah herself, in First Peter three says, you know, Sarah. So when you go back to the Old Testament, look at Sarah. Sarah wore a lot of jewelry, right? So you can't use Sarah as a reference not to wear gold. So the main thing there in First Peter three is not about not wearing gold, but it's about the hidden man of the heart uh, that should stand out. So, to a quick answer to your question is, uh, you know, uh, it's you, you know, you you wear gold, you wear jewelry. It's fine. People did it in the old in, in the Bible. Uh, it's not nothing wrong with it. But our focus is not on the outward appearance. Our focus is on, you know, uh, having a pure heart before God. Okay. So uh, let's see now. Last one is Genesis Leviticus 19 and verse 28. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so Leviticus 19, 20. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. Okay. So th this is one of those verses, verse 27, 28, which I was uh, just referring. Uh, the context there is about respect for the dead or uh, uh, and, uh, for, uh, 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 you know, the spiritism, the witchcraft, those kind of things. So that's, that's the reason why they're doing this, right? So, uh, so that's why I say, you know, we, we can't, we don't, and we can't use these scriptures and say don't tattoo or don't put marks. Otherwise, you know, for many reasons, we do mark our bodies in various ways. Um, so I don't judge people. We don't judge people about the tattoos. Uh, and plus, when you come into the New Testament, you understand we are not subject to the law. And we will talk about that later. Because if I use one or two verses from the Mosaic law, 
I'll have to take every scripture in the Mosaic Law and keep it, which includes the Ten Commandments, the uh, sacrificial laws, the ceremonial laws, the community laws. You'll have to keep everything, right? Uh, I can't take two scriptures and say, well, you follow this and, you know, from the Mosaic Law. Well, if you're going to follow it, Paul writes in Galatians, you've got to keep the whole thing, uh, all of the law. But he says, Galatians 2.16, by the law, nobody's justified. And we will see later on that the New Testament teaches us we've got something better than the Mosaic Law. Okay, we'll come to that in the future. Um, okay, last question maybe. There's a church that doesn't believe in women wearing jewelry, cutting their hair, wearing makeup. Is this biblical um, under the law in the Old Testament? Okay, so yeah, that's kind of just what we spoke about, Shani, that, you know, uh, there are a lot of things in the Old Testament which, you know, together we say is the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, so many things. But we are not subject to that, right? Uh, I, I'll just give you two quick references. If you go with me to Galatians 5, um, and uh, Galatians 5, I think it's verse 18, Paul says, if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Galatians 5 and verse 18. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Galatians 5, 18. So the New Testament, the believer is led by the Spirit. So he's not under the law. We don't live by the law. So we are, first of all, as the New Testament believers, we are led by the Spirit. Second, Romans 13. If you walk in love, you fulfill the law. Romans 13, verse 10, I think it is. Uh, Romans 13, yeah. Romans 13, verse 10. Love is a fulfillment of the law. So if you walk in love, you've kept the law. So two things for New Testament. You're led by the Spirit. You're not under the law. You walk in love. You fulfill the law. So that's how we live right? in the New Testament. We are not subject to the Old Testament law. Okay, just to quickly sum up, we have a full chapter coming up on that where we, we discuss these things. Okay, hope that helps. Okay, all right. I know we I tried to quickly answer several questions. Um, um, okay, so what we were talking about is this holiness thing, right? We are called to be holy, sanctified, which means in our standards, in our values. We are different, right? But, uh, and I think the reason all these questions came up is because many times holiness is evaluated based on these things, okay? Uh, I'll just quickly close with a testimony. You know, when I was uh, in college, uh, I, I just moved to the U.S. to go study in college. And uh, so one year I was living with some Christian people. Uh, we were sharing, you know, as students, you know, you usually rent a house and everybody shares the place. So then, then after one year, uh, the lease ended and so everybody was going out finding uh, on their own. So I was looking for a place and then uh, to go stay uh, for my next year. And uh, uh, so I I'd, I'd put a notice in the church bulletin, I'm looking for a place to stay. And that particular Sunday, a guy walked in to the service. So they handed him the bulletin and he walked out. So he didn't even stay for the service. But then he saw my name there. He called me and he said, hey, I saw your name in the bulletin. Are you looking for a place? And I said, yeah. Uh, uh, he said, come and see my place. Now, I didn't have a car or anything. So I said, I don't, I don't know where you live. He said, no, I'll come and pick you up. So he came. He came in a red pickup truck. And the moment I got and he turned on the car and there was this heavy metal music going on. I was like, oh gosh, what, what, did I, what am I getting myself into? And anyway, so he took me to his place. It was near the campus itself. And uh, I saw the place. I liked the place. Then he asked me so many questions. He said, do you drink? I said, no. Uh, he said, uh, do you, would you bring girls over? I said, no. Uh, he said, uh, you know, what kind of music you listen to? He said, gospel music. I said, gospel music. Uh, so after he asked all these questions, he said, you know, I don't think we can be roommates because I drink, I listen to heavy metal music, uh, I might bring some girls over, all of that stuff. I said, I, I don't think we can be roommates, he told me. Then I, I went back, I was praying, and in my spirit I felt I need to step in. I need to go live with him. 
because I believe light is more powerful than darkness. So I called him back and I said, hey, uh, I want to come and be your, room, your housemate. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I want to come and be there. Now, I'm not telling everybody to do this, but there I had a word from God. I knew God wanted me to be there. So I moved in with him. And, uh, you know, like he said, he would, uh, you know, when we go grocery shopping, he would buy his six pack of beer and everything, all that stuff. And he had his music going on and everything. But in one and a half years that I lived with him, things changed. We used to, you know, sit down, we'll have uh, our dinner together. Sometimes he will drink his beer, I'll drink my cup of milk and, you know, have dinner. He would ask me questions, I would explain things from the Bible. In one and a half years, his life changed so much. You know, he, on his own, I didn't tell him to do it. First thing, he got rid of all his heavy metal music. He threw it out. He had a big collection. Uh, he stopped, you know, swearing, using all that. He stopped bringing girls over. Next thing I know, he stopped uh, the the buying, even even stopped beer. I remember one day I came back from college, said, hey, go look in the free, uh, refrigerator. There was no beer. So what happened? He said, gone, it's gone. He gave his life to Christ. He became part of a church. And I never forced him. I just lived with him. I believed light is more powerful than darkness. And of course, after one and a half years, you know, we went our separate ways. Until today, in fact, I think last year he called me. He's now in Arizona. He called me. He said, there's one person who's really impacted my life, and it is you. And this happened way back, you know, uh, in college. This is in the early 1990s. And here we are 30 years later. He still remembers. And he called me. And he said, one person who's impacted my life, and it is you. And I saw in one and a half years, his whole life change. You know, uh, just that light is more powerful than darkness. And that's how we must live. Okay, I've taken more time. Uh, we're going to close. Okay. Uh, okay, God bless you guys. Uh, it's uh, time over now. Uh, I'll see you again. Okay, and please head to your, uh, uh, to your, take your break and get to it for your next class. Okay. See you again soon. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Bye now.